At a time of deep division in today's society, we must come together for humanity's sake. On Can We Talk 360, we strive to stimulate an authentic conversation on issues that affect all of us in an environment of tolerance. I am Eugene Pettis, attorney and community servant. Tune into our discussion to foster a greater awareness of yourself and others. Let's discover how there is strength in our differences and an abundance of possibilities when we stand together as one humanity. Welcome back, Dr. Butler, to Can We Talk 360. Uh, we had a great conversation, a stimulating conversation on critical race theory and, and what we see. And we talked about on the previous episode how you... Uh, in Osceola County was getting ready in January of this year, 22, uh, to give a lecture on the long road of civil rights. And you were for a National Association of Education and it got canceled because of the fact that in the title that you utilized, talking about the long road of civil rights, uh, it was said that there are concerns of the critical race theory being a part of that. Even though critical race theory was nowhere in the topic, uh, you were talking about history, civil rights history, that's such a huge part of American history, but you were canceled and not permitted to proceed. Uh, uh, so I want to continue this conversation on, 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 the, on critical race theory uh, that has had an impact on our K through 12 curriculum uh, and an impact on society in general. One of the things I want to pick up on is one of your colleagues, uh, uh, his, his name was, uh, his name is, I should say, um, uh, Professor Chris uh, Moser, I think is, is the way it's pronounced, who I believe is the director of the pre-law uh, program there at Flagler, Univer uh, Flagler College in St. Augustine was noted in the article, and he's talked about your incident with Osceola County School being a blessing in disguise. And when I saw that, yeah. it caught my, caught my attention. And he went on to say, this is a moment where people from different background can come together and ask, what are we afraid of? And there is a growing fear that whites are not going to be in the majority. That was a quote attributed to him. Uh, what are we, what are we afraid of from your perspective? Change. We're afraid of having our preconceived notions successfully challenged, I think. Um, we're afraid of the truth. What Professor Moser said, which I think was really, really interesting, is that she thought it was beneficial that this happened. And that reminds me of something that one of the first NBC reporters told me that reached out to me about the story. And that was, this is the first of many stories that are yet to come about this issue of intellectual censorship. So with Professor Mosier's comment about forcing the issue, it brings what is typically done in the shadows in legislative subcommittees, in pep rally press releases with only your supporters around you. It has flesh, fleshed out the, the real stakes. And the stakes are, this is nothing short of censorship. And the fact that you said I was canceled, yeah, literally, and both metaphorically by the political subset that hates cancel culture, right? So I think what Professor Mosier implied about it's a good thing that this happened is I know that on this campus it was a good thing that it happened because we had a campus-wide talk about intellectual freedom and why it is we teach what we teach and why is it that we do what we do how do we do what we do so that we can have these conversations publicly in a public forum sometimes academics aren't great about that 
you know. Um, oftentimes academics are sort of secluded in their ivory towers and we have these philosophical debates and thoughts and discussions with our peers when the real stakes are happening at the local level and we're not a part of those conversations. So I think the fact that Professor Mosier said, yeah, there is this fear and this is happening. And oh, by the way, it can happen here at Flagler College in St. Augustine, I think was was one of the, the, the positives of the story. But I think bottom line is um, many people are afraid of the other, whatever the other is at the time, whether it is the caravan of non-existent migrants that are trying to come across our border, whether it's the inner city Chicago born and bred drug dealer, whoever the other is at the time, that's the easy thing to be afraid of. Because like I said in the past episode, in the first episode, people who are afraid, people who are taught to hate, they're the ones that come out and vote because they feel that they're losing something. And the thing that I think, too, uh, Mr. Pettis, that stokes this fear is that parents are afraid that they're losing control over their own kids. And the one place where they can kind of assert control is in the schools. You might threaten to take my guns. You might threaten to ban prayer. You might threaten to uh, legalize abortion, but you're not going to impact what my kids are taught in schools. So that is, I think, one of the hot spots where people can go to fan the flames of anger and outrage for a specific political purpose, and that's local schools. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've represented Broward County School District for 30 years. I've represented Miami-Dade, Palm Beach County School Districts over the past decades. Um, during the pandemic, to see the politicalization of mass in the school setting and the threats of boards and districts uh, with financial penalties um, uh, was shocking, uh, shocking. But I want to go to the first point you mentioned, uh, the fear of, of change. It took me back to, I visited South Africa seven or eight years ago. And one of the things I was interested in is talking to locals on apartheid and both Africans, white South Africans and black South Africans. And I'll never forget a cab driver talk, I would ask him, how has things been since apartheid was ended? And he said that the greatest fear that white South Africans had was that we were gonna retaliate and try to treat them the way that they treated us for so many decades. He said, we were not interested in retaliating. We wanted the opportunity to be free. And we never looked back, which was just very, very powerful because for so long, the, the, the Africans in power kept people basically enslaved uh, in so many inhumane situations because of fear that if we want to stop it, what are they going to do to us? Yeah. And that man's mindset uh, led to years and years and years longer uh, of trauma to that country's people uh, because of fear. And so often the fear, as we said in episode one, is a boogeyman. Yeah. It's just been put up there. It's not real but it's oftentimes manipulated for political gain uh, by those that want to gain power or stay in power. And citizens are, are taken advantage of on both sides of the equation, taken advantage of. And, and, you know, South Africa has gotten past apartheid. It's not a perfect country, nor is any, but they haven't had anything like the repercussions that they were fearful of by allowing a share of power. And, and some people believe that this whole effort of, of, of uh, critical race theory uh, and how it's being twisted and abused in its claimed uh, definition 
uh, it's just a part of using that as a source right. of political power. Absolutely. And, and, and I think it does relate to the teaching of history, Mr. Pettis, because if you look back throughout American history, anytime there is a great movement for a more just, equal society, whether it's the abolition of slavery, whether it is passage of the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, whether it's Brown v. Board, whether it's World War II, whether it's formations of groups like the Black Panthers, who are so incredibly maligned, it's all about moving toward more equality. There's no retribution. There's no widespread movement to enslave white people. Our history demonstrates that when there is movement toward a more equitable society, there is not the repercussion that some politicians use as the justification to continue the inequality, period. So again, if we take that history and we sanitize it, and we bastardize it, and we lie about it, then we can't see that, no, people don't want revenge. They want equality. They don't want to punish other people because they know what punishment feels like. They want to be able to live their lives without the oppression that they had experienced for generations before and raise their children and grandchildren in a more equitable society. That's one of the things that history teaches us. It's remarkable that after the end of the Civil War, you don't have more widespread uprisings of slave owners that are slaughtered. You don't have that. You don't have that. So, yeah, again, the history here informs our debates that we're having now. So that if you can shut down the teaching of these complex historical topics that do cause some discomfort, as they should, then you don't really realize that what we're being fed today is a steady stream of inaccurate lies. That's so well stated. Um, one of the one of the um, critical things, um, and and I'm I'm heavily engaged in the, at the University of Florida have been since I I uh, graduated in out of law school in '85. Uh, but our educational institutions from K through 12 into college and beyond uh, is one of the last hopes for open conversations. Um, uh, if we, you know, in society, uh, I have people on both sides of the aisles that are good friends of mine. Yeah. Um, in my little circle, we can talk about certain issues. We don't always agree. And they may take one political vote and I may take another political vote. It doesn't make either of us wrong or right. evil or bad. You get to make your decision at the end of the day once you've been educated. Uh, somehow we need to, to let society know that we're a better society. We're a greater humanity when we allow ourselves to learn from the walk of the other person. Um, you know, if you and I, you know, I'm 61, you're somewhere around my age, if you're younger than me, uh, if, if, if I was to talk about you growing up in Alabama, I'm growing up here in Fort Lauderdale. Those are probably two different roads. Yep. Um, one is not right and one is not wrong. It's our realities. But if we talked, then we'll start coming up with commonalities. Even on these different roads, there have been commonalities of our life that bring certain um, uh, human links that we can learn from each other. And even those things that I had no experience with, it gives me a, a different perspective because sometimes our fears are merely lack of insight and perspective and knowledge. Uh, how can, you know, I, I'm just really challenged in this time period of my life of how we can get beyond uh, the, the, the politic and allow people to, to be more informed with facts so they're not so manipulated 
with falsehoods? Wow, that's another great question. Um, the, 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 the depth of the questions continue from episode to episode, Mr. Pettis. I, I, you, you've just said a lot and I think that, or you just, yeah, you threw out a lot and asked a really tough question. I think number one, I'm troubled that we often disagree about the nature of facts. Um, you know, I, I think it was Daniel Patrick Monaghan that said, you can have your own opinion, but you cannot choose your own facts. You know, John Adams, when he was defending the English soldiers, said facts are a troublesome thing. You know, if we say we want the truth, sometimes, you know, to quote a few good men, we can't handle the truth. We have to go back to the primary sources. We have to agree upon a set of facts that we can move forward in discussing. Now, our interpretation of those facts can be different. But we've got to agree on the facts. There are no such thing as alternative facts, right? I think maybe the, the struggle that I've had with something that you just said is that diversity is our strength. It's hard to dialogue with people who think diversity is going to become our undoing. That's tough. How can we convince people, people like us who know better, diversity gives you perspectives that you would not have otherwise considered. Diversity helps me understand that a now successful 60 young year old African-American in South Florida has had this rich, unique experience that I can learn from and appreciate and hang out with. How can we let people know that diversity is actually in their best interest? Right. And I think sometimes we talk about these things as a zero sum game. I think a lot of people who don't see perspective and don't understand the depth of issues, who think very linearly, very simply, they look at if you get something, it's going to come at my expense. When that's the antithesis of a free market capitalistic America is, whatever you get as a fellow citizen does not come at my expense. And when it does, that's when we have conflict, right? Um, you went and uh, back earlier to your experiences and day with the mask mandates. And, you know, that's, again, this idea of individual freedom balanced against the good of the whole it's something that we haven't done really well, particularly with the pandemic, you know, and I understand, you know, I, I will say with Osceola County, one of the reasons that I mentioned, I believe in our last episode with the timeline that I gave you, the, the fact that the house, the, the, I think it was an executive order that DeSanta signed against the teaching of CRT, those school districts are scared to death now because they have lost money for trying to protect students, staff, and teachers in the midst of a pandemic by asking them to wear a mask, they've lost state money. So I get that there is that fear of you violated X because politically we're against it. So therefore, we're going to take an underfunded school district and withhold funding. That's, that's, that's the stuff of dictatorships, right? Um, so I guess my, my comments here are sort of circular, but how can those of us who understand that diversity is our strength explain that persuasively to people who see the opposite, that our diversity is a detriment? And two, at what point do we give up a few individual liberties to protect those in the whole of society. That's where I think we've kind of lost our way. And those are sort of the, the gray areas where there is no right answer and is no wrong answer that politicians have absolutely uh, pounced upon as divisive for their own political gain. You've touched, I was the uh, president of the Florida Bar in 2013-14, first and only African-American thus far, and hopefully it'll change sometime soon, to serve. Um, and I, I, I had the clarion call of diversity 
is our strength. And there is no state that has more diversity than the state of Florida. Yeah. Uh, and I started what's called the William Reese Smith uh, Leadership Academy. And the William Reese Smith Leadership Academy has uh, had a curriculum, it's a, annual, a year long curriculum of lawyers uh, that have about six different sessions teaching skill sets that are necessary to be successful in the practice and successful in life, successful in the community, to be not just a good warrior, but to do what our creed of professionalism talks about is doing good, public good. Uh, and one of the things that uh, it talked about is there's room at the table of opportunity. And, and you're absolutely right. People believe that it, if, if, if you get something, it means you took something from me. And we're blessed to be in a country that has so much of abundance of stuff and resources until I'm always, a, I'm really, it's a breakthrough moment when I can see people realize there's more than enough to go around. You enlarge the table. Instead of eight, you put 12 at the table. Nobody goes hungry. Everybody can, you know, have their, their riches that they need of money, uh, experiences, opportunities, whatever it is that you are at the table to get. And it's only when people realize that we can enlarge the table of opportunity and right. not have the need to fear how it's going to impact what I take home. Uh, until we break through that, uh, we're at a, a stumbling block in society. Uh, and I've seen the breakthrough in many instances. I've seen people appreciate once they, you, you, you're forced to enlarge the table. I've been, I've been blessed in my 37 years of being a lawyer. I was on the water management district of South Florida, biggest water management district we had. Uh, Governor, late Governor Lawton Childs put me on there in 1991 to 1999. I was the first there, the youngest they had put on at that point in time. I was 31 years of age. And uh, there were issues back then. The Croson decision uh, was hot. And, and, and doing public set-asides to try to level the feel of play. And I was very strong in my advocacy of opportunities. It's not enough to say, okay, in 2022, we're going to start being fair to everybody. Everybody has an opportunity. That's not enough because the criteria for the opportunity has been written by somebody that you got to have 25 years experience. You got to have these many trucks to have the job. You have to have this much uh, projects. And if I'm just getting in the game today, I have to wait 25 years to really compete. And I push that issue of just, just being honest with each other. If you're yeah. truly uh, interested in an equitable society, a fair society, we have to be willing to do something to truly level the playing field. And you have to be believe that you can share and not be disadvantaged. You can share some of your riches and not be disadvantaged. And, and, you know, it reminds me of a quote from Dr. King, right? In his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? He said, we live in a nation that wants us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we don't even own boots. You know, let's be honest. Yeah. We want people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and they have no boots. I've had meagerly, but we have had opportunities at home ownership in my family lineage that your family lineage would not have had. That adds to generational wealth over three, four, five generations that puts me in a different position than may put your kids or may put you, right? We have to be honest about this. A lot of white folks are born on third and think they hit a triple. And they expect the person at the plate who's marginalized who looks different than them to be on the same base with them when that's that's not being honest. That's not being honest. That and and oh by the way, I hate to say it, but that's part of critical race theory. When we examine how public policy is influenced by historical truth, 
that's what you've just described as critical race theory. How can we explain how some groups are marginalized and that works against them in the contemporary? You know, that's above my pay grade. That's a law school seminar. I'm not teaching it to third graders, but that's exactly what you just said. The other thing too about Florida, and you're right, diverse city, very politically polarized state. Um, Miami is the diverse city, the, the, the Bay County, diverse county. I'm always, when, when people ask me, you know, why Florida? Why are the, the it seems that now the, Debates are so sharp in Florida. It seems that Florida, Texas, and Virginia are in a, in, and Arizona are in a four-man contest to the bottom sometimes. In Texas. <laughs> and to, yes, yes. How could I leave out Texas? But, um, you know, the, the documentarian Billy Corbin always says that the Florida of today is the America of tomorrow. And when you look at the trends and you look at the battles, it's true. Yeah. Florida tends to experience them first, but they eventually impact the nation as a whole. So, you know, paying attention to what's going on here in terms of all of these things might be local or statewide discussions, but we are having them at the national level. We mirror in Florida what is going on in the rest of the nation. Um, so, yeah, I, it's, it's really tough to understand issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity without understanding the role that history has played on many of those sociological and economic factors. And in your world, the DE&I world, the diversity, equity, and inclusion world, and job training, this is where, again, the war on CRT, and I use air quotes, the war on CRT, has impacted the way we even train our workers. So it's not just a problem in the schools, it's becoming a problem in the workforce as well. A divisive issue that's being used polarize people in their places of employment and that's that's the least american practice that we can have in our workforces today in my opinion the um and, and on your latter point uh in addition to some of the individuals that are challenging uh florida's um uh, stop walk act as it's referred to that went into effect on july 1st um of, of this year, just a couple of weeks ago, um, some of the corporate entities, Ben and Jerry's, yeah. one of their franchises here in the state of Florida, has gotten into a number of corporations who state we have as a part of our protocols and 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 employment uh, uh, practices to to teach certain respect of of race and 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 different things to our employees that's a part of what we do and they're now being influenced by a a, a law that's been put in there that they're calling everything that they've done these are private companies everything that they've done is violation of uh, critical race theory and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because people that were so much pro-business are now attacking businesses to to enforce their own agenda as opposed to letting businesses do what the businesses want to do within their various industries uh uh and are and are impacting it with their own politic from um, the party that is pro-business and anti-big government yeah. they're using big government to punish private businesses and, and it, you know it happened to the cruise industry when they wanted to have people come on to cruises with masks they said, well, take away your right to come into our dock space. Uh, on and on. One of the points that was interesting uh, you made about, you know, just how home ownership, and we know the redlining laws and all of that that we've had such a long history of in this country uh, that prohibited people of color to, to, to have access to housing uh, inventory. Uh, one of the amazing pieces of history that we have, and it's I guess it would be against the law to teach this now because it may make somebody uncomfortable, uh, is the Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. Oh my gosh. Uh, 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 here it is, a community that truly uh, exemplified all that's great about America, that it's the land of opportunity. And from bankers to, to doctors, 
they built a community that was so successful and what did and home ownership and business ownerships and just it was incredible when you look at what they had put together in those decades that they built that community and what happened they came down with planes dropping acid bombs oh, yes. and everything else and burned the entire town down i saw a woman who was the last survivor of that she's a hundred and something years old on tv this past weekend and she talked about it she was a little girl at the time and she talked about what happened to their community and then you can't look at those oklahomians and the descendants of those people and say okay let's get you know we're gonna uh, uh start today and you're considered equal and ignore all that was taken away from them Imagine those families if they had allowed those businesses to continue to flourish. I would say even look locally. Look at um, Rosewood. Look at places like Rosewood. Look at Ocoee. Mm -hmm. Look at Perry. We have our own little black Wall Streets in the state of Florida. We, we I mean, after Rosewood, people left and didn't come back to the 1980s. So biggest race riot in american history prior to watts in 64 was chicago in 1919. you know this is the the again for people to say that well race is an issue in american history but we spend an inordinate amount of time on african-american history no no that's totally incorrect race is one of the most important factors in our nation's history for understanding where we are now. You can't, again, you can't understand Trumpism. Well, I, I, Mr. Pettis, when I was watching January 6th happen in real time, the only thing I could think was all of this is happening because we elected a black man president. I had so, that conversation today. If you, to take race out of the equation, is like looking at the equation of American history. It's like thinking of your favorite movie and removing a leading character. The movie doesn't make sense. You know, and the, the, the one that I use for my students often is Star Wars. Take the original Star Wars trilogy, take Han Solo out. Now, what sense does it make? The plot line's different. The way that you think you understand the topics are different. That's the same thing with looking at American history and trying to take race out of our history. It doesn't make sense. It's incomplete and even worse, it's dishonest. And I think that's one of the reasons that this whitewashing of history should matter to all Americans, not just teachers, not just scholars. The rewriting of the past, the intentional rewriting of the past is a tool that authoritarians use to validate what they do in the contemporary times. It is dangerous for the future of democracy when we have people in positions of power who actively seek to alter our history. That is a tool of authoritarians across the board. And that should give us great pause for all people who claim to love America as much as others do. Well stated and, and uh... We're going to wrap up one of the things that you just triggered in my in my mind is so many people are engaged in the day-to-day -day of survival just going to work dealing yeah. with families issues and all of these things you're talking about is under their radar yeah. they they don't get engaged they don't study it it's not affecting me and my household but history is dictated that if we ignore what's happening to one uh, and then it happens to the next people or group, then it happens to the next. At some point in time, it's going to happen to you and there's going to be no one there to help defend it. Absolutely. Somehow we have to awaken ourselves as a community and that's the community of humanity, a broader community, not racial or socially economic, but a community uh of 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 humanity 
and recognize um, that none of us are ever going to be secure, or as Martin Luther King said, free until the least of us is free. And that's such a truism. Um, uh, I was getting ready to go in to my bar presidency. I was in Texas at a meeting and um, a gentleman by the name of Dennis Archer, who is, he's, a, he's just an incredible um, uh, gentleman. He was the first African-American president 30 years ago of the American Bar Association. He was the um, justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. He, he's just beyond uh, success and recognized for all he has accomplished in his career. I met him for the first time. It was about three or four months before my uh, swearing in as president. And he said, we, I said, pleasure meeting you, uh, Dennis. He says, well, before you leave, let me ask you something. He said, what's your dominant hand? I said, I'm right hand dominant. And he said, as you continue to climb the ladder of success, I want you to pull yourself up by your left hand. And I want you to reach back and lift others by your dominant right hand. Now that's a twist on what we normally do. What we normally do is use our best for ourselves. And if we got anything else left, we may give it to somebody. I think the key to us reversing some of the trends we see in society is being willing to give our best to our fellow man mm -hmm. and to understand that we are one humanity. Even though you walked on the roads of Alabama and I walked on the roads of Fort Lauderdale, South Florida, we have more in common That's right. than we do in difference. Uh, and until we trust that, that, that uh, claim. We're going to be at odds. Uh, and our odds are so insignificant in comparison to all that we have in common. Um, it has been a great pleasure. I'm going to allow you to have closing remarks, but I could continue to talk this conversation endlessly. Uh, um, I will, hopefully we will stay in contact. Uh, I really ask for God's speed for you to stay on the path of speaking truth to power and making facts continue to count in this space. Uh, but share with us your closing words. Give me some hope uh, for tomorrow as it relates to critical race theory, as it relates to educating and all of us being educated on the better and higher level of what humanity is all about. I am encouraged by programs like this, and that's not pandering. I, I relish the opportunity to have dialogue with people such as yourself in the hopes that maybe someone who hasn't considered one of the points that we brought up hears it, and it makes a difference for them and thus someone else. But I'll tell you where I am most optimistic, and that's the next generation. You know, we often malign the millennials, and they're always on their phones, and they don't care about anything but themselves. I do not have that experience at all, Mr. Pettis. I think that over the past 10 years or so, I have seen more willingness of young people to do what they can to make a change in their communities than I have seen at any other time in my educational career. And for me, that's what gets me up and coming to class every day, preaching the gospel of historical accuracy, and, and absolutely loving what I do. Um, I think that the future is in good hands, and I think that's one reason that some people are so afraid. They know that their world is changing, and it's going to be young people that change it for the better. People don't like change, but they love improvement, and I see improvement coming with the next generation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, insight, and thanks for being uh, committed to, to, to the cause. Uh, we're all better off because people like you, uh, Dr. You. Butler, uh, continue to speak the truth.
Well, thank uh, you so much. Thank you. That thank you, sir. Life. All the best to you. Thank you, and Godspeed to you as well, Mr. Pettis. Thank you. The law firm of Hallitzer, Pettis & Schwamm is a proud sponsor of the Can We Talk 360 podcast. Our firm handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, catastrophic personal injury litigation, and workers' compensation matters. We pride ourselves in being advocates for justice on behalf of those who have been seriously injured. For decades, we've taken the lead in making your case our priority. It's who we are. It's who we'll always be. Hallitzer, Pettis & Schwamm. Serious injuries, proven results. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Can We Talk 360? I sincerely hope that you are inspired to seize this moment in time and take real action towards change. Remember, all change begins with a conversation. Be sure to tune in every month for more fascinating discussions and motivational food for the soul. Please share with your friends, family, and colleagues. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Can We Talk 360 and visit us on the web at www.canwetalk360.com.